Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. Uh, I always like to go chronological. Uh, uh, it's a Thursday, uh, throwback Thursday on the 17th of November. It's literally a week from Thanksgiving. And uh, I'm here with Yorona Boster. And, and uh, I think uh, I'll actually read the title because it's a long title so people will know what they're going to be listening to uh your own is a tedx speaker certified life coach certified speaker coach infertility coach we'll talk about that uh she's a mentor and advocate lost trauma and parent coaching uh a thought leader and on the graduate of rutgers uh blaustein school of public policy uh, and planning and and we met um uh our, our, social media you know that's that's the name of the game we met on social media and in the minute uh, i had seen irona's background it was like oh wow uh and 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 then i i always like to probe uh, uh as an interviewer and, and 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 try to extract particulates i'm saying this so nicely particulates uh, of commonality and, and the rutgers thing of course caught me because you know i'm a rutgers uh, and, and the infertility caught me because uh, that's, you know, it's, it's been part of my my world. Uh, so I'm, I'm especially sensitive to that. Um, it is it is what it is. Uh, so uh, a week before Thanksgiving is a very festive time of year for me. You know, Thanksgiving is great. You know, it's food, football, friends, family. Uh, it's all the F's. I guess. But uh, I'm really thrilled, uh, Yorona, how this all kind of came together. We we had Zooms last week to really get acquainted. Uh, and uh, I'm really thrilled about this for so many reasons. So uh, this monologue is now concluded. And I'm officially introducing you. And if you want to do a little bit of a bio. Sure. Uh, and, you know, you've had a, a, by the way, you've had quite a powerful life. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, you beyond, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I actually, uh, there's enough there for folks out there. There's enough about you and your journey that there's a movie here. No, no, really. You know, <laughs> Maybe uh, one day. We'll see. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, there really is. You, I mean, you've done it all. You've been through it all. Yeah. Um, it's good and bad. Um but anyway, I'm done. So okay. uh, introduce sure. yourself. Take it away. Sure. Okay. So my name's Yorona Boster. I won't go to my middle name or my native name because that will just get people very confused. Um, but um, I know loss in and of a nutshell. Um, I, in my professional life, um, I bounced around a bit after college, um, after Rutgers, uh, because I kind of got into a place of like, I don't know if I want to go the rest of the way down the road of the professional, um, you know, schooling. So I figured, all right, I'll jump into other areas. I jumped into the arena of vet tech work. I did some work for, um, uh, for senior care. Um, I was even a, a rabbi's personal assistant at one point, <laughs> but ultimately where I landed and where I really made, um, made an effort to make a difference was in the 15 years that I worked in the field of early childhood in the program called early intervention. It is a program that is um, federally and sometimes state funded. Most of the United States individual states put some funding into it, but it is a primarily federally funded program. Um, it goes in accordance with the IDEA and for New Jersey, it's New Jersey part C. It's a program for children with developmental delays and disabilities from the ages of birth to age three. And it assists parents. It's a, it's a parent coaching model, a parent training model um, to help these parents provide, um, uh, to help with supporting their needs um, and providing developmental um, therapeutic services in the form of occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, physical therapy, uh, one we call developmental intervention, which utilizes special educators and child development specialists. And it really helps parents um, work with their child's unique needs when dealing with a developmental delay or disability. Um, I came to the realization a little while back that I 
wanted to make more of an impact and I could do more with the knowledge that I had. And I decided to walk down the path of life coaching and I became a certified life coach. I also ended up with a unique opportunity to become a certified speaker coach. Um, so now I get to work with people who are trying to land their, um, their own Ted talks or TEDx talks or keynotes. Um, and, uh, and I work with helping them formulate their talks at the same time as I was doing this, I also landed my own talk. Um, and my one area that I really realized was a need that a lot of parents weren't recognizing was the concern of loss and how that affects child development. Um, and so that is kind of where I am today with the programming that I do, the parenting workshops that I do, the one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do as a parent coach. Um, I also work with people in the world of infertility because I was struggled with that for many, many years. Um, and so I do a lot of advocacy work with, um, with that as well as running support groups. And uh, that's through Resolve, the National Infertility Association. I love, and I love to do advocacy work with them on a local and federal level. Um, and yeah, that is essentially in a nutshell what I do. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna we'll go back. Um, we're gonna jump around. Uh, sure. Just, uh, to jump around. Um, so you you are an accomplished TEDx speaker, and you know, I, I, um, and, and lots of people don't know what the world of TEDx is all about. Uh, more people do know than ever before, but uh, uh, not even myself. I mean, I know what it is, but it, it's um, so. In part of your TEDx speaking, you, you talk about how loss, how loss which you've gone through shapes who we are and how we live. So can you yeah. just give a little picture of that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something that we get fundamentally wrong um, in the world is forgetting our life boundaries. Um, we come into this world with a very life focus, like I can do anything. I could be anything. And that's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. And as parents, we often try to support that for our children. You know, I want my child to be able to do everything and anything they want to be able to do. And that's great. And yet when we get to the place where we're dealing with struggles, with hurdles, with challenges, with losses, we find ourselves lacking the ability to help our child process that and move forward successfully in life. And usually we do the polar opposite, especially in the, la in the change over the last 40, 50 years in the parenting styles. We've created a, a society where parents are trying to do their best to protect their children from experiencing the pains and struggles and hurdles um, at, at a lot, at a detriment to their development. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, as human beings, we are finite creatures. And being a finite creature means this comes to an end for every single one of us. But how do we accept that? The problem is that we don't want to face that. And oftentimes as parents, we especially don't want to face that for our children. But the reality is that at some point, we will no longer be here to help guide our children. And we certainly won't be here to protect our children. And one of the ways we do them the biggest disservice is by not helping them process these losses of life so that when we're gone, they can process the ultimate loss, which is the loss of losing you, their parent. So I, I came up with this idea called foundational losses. And I realized that this was the only way I was waking parents up. I started seeing light bulbs happening over parents. I would have my staff, they would come to me and they'd be like, oh, Yorona, it doesn't matter what I say to this parent, but they, they're they just, they're not giving their children rules. They're not giving them boundaries. They're not, they're not helping them in, you know, positive discipline and stuff like that. I'm not talking about punishment. I'm talking about positive discipline and healthy boundaries and, and rules that they can live by and stuff like that. And I started to see something, a pattern develop, you know, um, a child loses a toy because they broke it when they're young, you know, oh, that's a loss. 
they don't get a good grade, even though they studied really hard. Maybe they studied really hard. Maybe they didn't, but they don't get a good grade. That's a loss. They don't get into the after school program they wanted. That's a loss. They don't get into the college they wanted. They don't get the job they wanted. They lose a relationship. All of these are losses and they are foundational to the way that we function as human beings. Now, there are plenty of people who've experienced significant losses way too early in life. That is true. Absolutely. Um, that said, though, the majority of people, there's an, a stepping stones that we reach these, these places in our lives, you know, these next steps, next steps, next steps. What do we do when we get there, though? I have a dear friend, and she and I both lost our parents. She struggles to get through every single day. She has a lot of issues, a lot of things that are going on for her, but she struggles. And I lost my parents as well. And that's not to say I don't struggle on occasion with it. That's not to say I don't acknowledge the pain that it still sometimes in ingests in me, but I also realize I have a choice in that moment. I can let this completely disable me or I can choose how to live with the losses. And that's what I tried best to teach people. Um, I think it's painfully not discussed enough. Yeah. It, it, um, it's kind of, I mean, in my own and uh, very uninformed opinion, the whole subject of loss and, and the different stages uh, in the preparation, the whole, it's just painfully, uh, uh, it, is it a human thing to just kind of sweep it uh, under the carpet? Uh, and Yes, and not through any, not through any desire to hurt somebody, but actually but often with the best of intentions, you know, well-meaning intentions though, don't necessarily um, help people survive and thrive. So like, for instance, I had a friend who told me that her parents didn't let her go to her grandfather's funeral. I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. How old were you? And she said she was 18, Wow. 18, wow. but her parents felt it would be better for her not to have to experience that funeral. Yet she never got to say goodbye to her grandfather the way she wanted to. Wow. This is a very hard thing for people to deal with. We, we lost our cat um, last year. So my son hadn't even turned four yet. And we had, we had actually had two cats. He was three months old when our other cat um, went. And now we had Kitty and he loved her to pieces. They were bosom buddies. He called her his sister. Um, he'd carry her all over the place. And she was like, she tolerated anything and everything he wanted to do to her. She was just in love with him. So when I realized that she was getting to that point and I realized that she was struggling, she was 19, you know, and I, I knew it was time and I knew she was in pain and I knew she was suffering. I bought a couple of books for him, you know, and I, we read them together. Um, you know, um, it's okay to say goodbye by Todd Parr. Um, when a pet dies by the incomparable Mr. Rogers, um, and cat heaven. And, you know, it was not easy. It was not easy for me to watch him hurting over losing her. I was losing her, but I was also watching him lose her. And I had to get okay with the discomfort of watching my son suffer. And it's not okay. It's, it doesn't feel good. It's, there's no like, yeah, this is perfectly fine. No, there's none of that. No toxic positivity or anything is needed in that respect. But what is needed is the reality that sometimes we face hard things and there is no way to fix it. And we cannot fix it for our kids. You cannot fix everything they have to deal with in life. There's a saying, you prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. And that is because you don't know what's coming around the bend. You can't prepare the potholes. You cannot make every inch of that smooth for them. And especially you can't do it once you're gone. So how do you prepare the child to meet those 
potholes and those bumps and those, you know, uh, gravelly moments and those hardships that are inevitable. You help them recognize that it's inevitable. You accept that it's inevitable for you as a human being. And then you help them accept that and recognize that. And it's not always easy. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something quite honestly. I was in hysterics last night. I was crying and I could not stop. It was in bed. I have to put my son, I put my son to bed, but I finally let the tears come. My brother and best friend is dying. He is 47 years old. Mm -hmm. And I hope to God, he's not going to kill me for putting this up here before he goes, but or his wife, they're very private people, but he has cancer. I grew up with this man, you know, um, I say he's my brother and the truth is that he's not my blood brother, but our parents changed our diapers with each other. That's how long he's been in my life. I don't remember my life without him. Wow. And I was on the phone with him earlier but yesterday evening, and I could see he was in the end. And I could see by the things that he was saying that he was hitting this stage. And it hurts. And there's nothing that can take that hurt away. There are no perfect words that somebody else can say. There are no perfect magical wands that people can wave to fix it and to make it feel better. It feels crappy yep. it hurts it breaks your heart and you know what that's a part of what we go through that's a part of life so i released the valve and i was in hysterics and i was crying and crying and just when i thought i was done i cried more and i had like my eyes were like balls this morning <laughs> but I needed to release that valve. I needed to get that out. You know, there are a lot of times where parents will say to, to a child when they're crying, like, you're okay. It's okay. Don't worry. You're fine. It'll be okay. Or, oh, stop crying. It's not that bad. Or here, have a lollipop. It'll be better. Because we hurt watching our children hurt. We hurt watching our loved ones hurt. And that is natural. That is normal but we don't normalize it nearly enough. We don't give people the opportunity to just hurt and just say to them, that sucks. I don't have anything to say. I don't know what to say. I can't make this better for you. That really sucks. And I hope one day it'll get better. Yeah. Yeah. I, because I'm a, a because I'm a septuagenarian, mm. I, I ponder and I think about these things. Um, it's so interesting, you know. You, you go, you're ten, you're twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, and even sixty. And, and I swear, uh, and and you, the minute you rip that calendar off and you're you're seventy, it's a whole different perspective. Uh, it, it's literally just ripping the calendar, boom, 69 or 70. And, and it's like your head is filled with so much of this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, we could talk about it another time. Um, but I, I, I know exactly what you're saying and, and I deal with it in one shape, way or form every day. Uh, and I look for, I look for ways to understand and accept, um, uh it's a it's all day long you know i'm dealing with this i'm looking at a picture of my mother up on the wall there um um it, it's a and my father too uh, and my grandparents anyway um uh by the way this is not um it's not that i'm interviewing gilbert Gottfried here and we're going to be <laughs> laughing you know, this is heavy stuff and we're, you know what we're, well, I got to tell you something. There's laughter to be found in, in the grief process and in, and in loss. I'm as well. sure there is. Uh, I, I sure. can tell you some really funny stories. I kid you not. I have some funny ones. I mean, just figuring out with my father, what to put on his headstone was hysterical. I, we, I knew he was going to want a part of that process. I knew it. I was like, oh, you know, this is, this is my Abba. He's going to want to know. He's going to want to have the last word. 
<laughs> so I went into the place where he was at before we, um, before we left, uh, before we were bringing him home and I was going to be taking care of him as his primary caregiver with uh, the help of hospice. And I walked into the place and I'm like, Abba, we got to talk about what you want on your headstone. <laughs> and he's like, Whoa. Oh yeah, you're right. He's like, I don't want any of that. Uh, like forever in our hearts and stuff like that. That's just normal. I, I want something unique. I want something people will remember, you know? So we're like we're total gallows humor. We're totally throwing things back and forth. Like I had the last word and all sorts of stuff, just really, you know? And I suddenly thought, and I said to my, him, I was like, what about a man never at a loss for words? Because that was my father. It was very rare that he didn't have something to say. And it was like a light shone from his face. We are literally talking about what's going on his headstone. And he lit up and he's like, that's perfect. I love it. We were cracking up over this. Wow. And that's what's wow. on his headstone. Wow. No. That's a great and story. I, I have so many amazing stories when my mom was dying. I mean, she was a crackpot too. She was a total like gallows humor person. You want to hear something really cute? So we were we were going for one of her chemo sessions and she always had to have blood work beforehand. And she's, we're sitting there waiting for the phlebotomist to walk in and she walks in and she goes, hi, I'm Lauren. I'll be your phlebotomist for today. And I turn to my mom and I go on today's menu, we have the red vial or the blue vial. And my mom was cracking up so hard because the way she said it, I swear to God, it sounded like she was introducing herself as our waitress. So we just, we couldn't stop giggling after that. We couldn't, you know, and my mom had the funniest thing she would tell the doctors every single time. One of the doctors would say, Oh, this is so unexpected because let me tell you with her cancer, every turn was something going wrong. The first thing out of her mouth, the first time one of the doctors said that was, well, nobody ever expected the Spanish inquisition. And I was like in hysterics. And so was the doctor, you know, I mean, we had some really funny things, you know, and I think that's important. Um, you know, nobody gets out of this alive, right? <laughs> we, we all have got an end point, right? And if you can't find places to laugh and you can't find places to take the joy where you can get it, you do yourself a disservice because if you take life too seriously, you're the only one you have to blame at the end of your life when you didn't laugh enough. Laughter. Yeah, yeah we, Reader's Digest used to say it was the best medicine. And, and by the way, we could talk about that for a long, long time. We won't, but yeah. uh, we were talking about it before we went on air in, in, in yeah. shape, way, or form. The things that we don't understand that yeah. we're beginning to, but uh, anyway, uh, changing directions a little bit. Um, you are what's known as an, an infertility advocate. Um, and by the way, there's a, uh, a federal advocacy day, which I'd love you to talk about. Uh, uh, and and just talk about infertility because you've been through it. I've been through it. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, it, it, um we could talk for hours and we won't. We <laughs> yeah. can't. Uh, but uh yeah, so um, I mean you you lead groups and you counsel and uh yeah. and the only way to do it is you gotta live it. Yeah, yeah. I mean you can be an ally for the infertility world and that is so important. So like if you've if you have a loved one who's struggling with infertility, if you um, you yourself struggled with infertility and you resolved your your family building plan and you want to give back, that's an amazing thing. Um, that's what I chose to do. Um, I say this a lot. I say one sometimes when we feel most helpless, that is the moment we need to get out and help others, because it's one small way we could take back a little measure of control in our lives a little feeling that we are not quite so helpless because we can do for others. We can, we may not be able to do for ourselves, but we can for others. So um, I, my journey is so long, but I will shorten it. Um, 10 years of infertility, um, 2007, I had an ectopic pregnancy and emergency surgery. 
they saved my tube. Uh, but later, uh, as the years went on, I went on to have three miscarriages. I had two of them with um, DNCs. So they had to, to remove the, um, the embryo um, that was no longer functional. Um, and then after my mother died, my husband and I decided to try IVF. We did not have coverage for it, even though New Jersey is an amazing state and it has a lot at the time, we did not have coverage for it based on our employers and our situation. So we paid $20,000 out of pocket. Wow. We went for IVF um, because of my ectopic pregnancy and my miscarriages That was the, and, and my age. That was the best uh, course of action. I had just turned 40. So that was their plan. Um, we had four embryos retrieved with four embryos retrieve uh, eggs that were retrieved and then later and was and fertilized we ended up with four embryos they were all abnormal so that would have meant that had i been had i we done the transfers on any of them um i would have miscarried every single one Oy. so luckily we actually opted to put in more money to do the the um, chromosomal testing, which told us that they were abnormal embryos. So they weren't viable embryos. I think a lot of people get this wrong. They think an embryo is an embryo. It's a baby. It's not, it's not, if it's not going to actually sustain to an actual developed life, it's not, it's just still cells put together. Um, so after that, we went on to try to purchase our home and the summer of 2016, we were a week away from closing on our house. And I had another emergency surgery and ectopic, another ectopic pregnancy with emergency surgery. And in that emergency surgery, I lost my right fallopian tube. And the doctor went to see my husband while I was in recovery. And he said to my husband, you know, it's a really good thing she came in today because she probably would have hemorrhaged and bled out another day or two. Jeez. People don't realize how dangerous ectopic pregnancies are. They also don't realize something super important. And I want to put this out there to every single human being on this planet. Ectopic pregnancies are not viable pregnancies. They shouldn't even honestly be called pregnancies. They are implantations of an embryo in an incorrect location. And no, you cannot take the embryo out of where incorrectly implant, implanted and put it into the uterus. I know because I asked that in 2007, I was like, oh, could you do that? No, unfortunately we do not have the science to do so. So the other thing about an ectopic pregnancy is it is extremely dangerous. It is literally the life of the, of the woman that is carrying an ectopic pregnancy, if it is not removed, will die. Wow. It does not go away on its own. Once it's implanted outside of the uterus, it does not go away on its own. And it need, requires either medication if you're not too far along or surgery. I had surgery, unfortunately, both times. I was, I was actually... I did not realize I was a breath away from death, both of my ectopic pregnancies. My first one was so big that it had calcified to the size of a golf ball. And that is huge. And the doctor said, it is an absolute miracle that you did not hemorrhage and bleed out. And I was commuting from Pennsylvania to New Jersey at the time and had a very long drive and I could have bled out on the road. You, you were commuting to do the IVF? No, I was commuting at that time for work. Oh, for work. So this was a work yeah. thing. And, this was work. I was commuting when I was commuting living in Pennsylvania. You would have had this. If I would have bled, if I would have started bleeding while driving yeah. and pulled over, um, it's entirely plausible that an ambulance oh, would not goodness. have gotten to me in time and I would have died. So it's it's very tragic when people give misinformation about things that are literally life-threatening to another individual. If you don't know enough about it, you don't have the right to give that information. You don't have the right to talk about it. You should not talk about something you know nothing about. You need to do actual medical research to understand wow. it or just go to a professional. So here's the thing, though. After that ectopic pregnancy in 2016, I said to my husband, I don't think we're having kids. And I had to get to a place where I was OK with that. You know, I had to make my peace with it. And my sister said something to me that really hit home. You know, she said something a lot of parents get really wrong is that they make their kids their purpose in life. When the truth is that you are a human being here for a limited time, you have a purpose with or without kids. You have a purpose. So find your purpose. And that really helped me. I mean, she didn't say those exact words, but that's what I took away from it. And 
I realized she was right. I, I have a purpose. And I started doing a lot more advocacy work. I started doing all sorts of things. And I was in a really great pl place um, that my birthday that year, November 15th of 2016, bought a Thomas Kincaid painting. <laughs> um, and then I got pregnant again in January of 2017. Um, was pregnant with my son. Apparently I was about a week pregnant when I was at the women's March in uh, Washington wow. and I didn't know it. <laughs> so wow. my son was with me at the women's March. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he decided to stick around. He did. Wow. Yeah. By the way, uh, the word miracle comes to mind after everything you've gone through. That is a pure miracle. Yeah. And now here's the thing though. I'm fully aware of the fact that not everybody gets that. I was prepared to not, to have a family of two and our cats and be happy. You know, I was prepared for that. I made my peace with that. I closed the door or I thought I closed the chapter. You know, we weren't actively trying then not to conceive, but we were, we kind of gave up on the idea that we were, it was going to happen. Um, you know, I had just turned 41 I just didn't think it was possible. Um, you know, little did I know and the research that they actually started to do. So as I went along, progressed in my pregnancy, I ended up needing specialists. They deemed me elderly maternal age. Elderly. I said, that, that, that hurts a little. Could you change that to like, I don't know, advanced or something like that? I've heard other other facilities call it advanced. She's like, I know we really shouldn't call it that. I'm like, yeah, elderly. I'm not walking in here with a cane and everything. So it felt a little wrong. That's what it is. But I went to see these specialists and, um, I ended up with gestational diabetes. I had a, a bunch of just Ooh. things, but you know, I was going dealing. And what was very interesting was one of the specialists said that interestingly, between my first ectopic pregnancy and my last ectopic pregnancy, which were almost 10 years apart in the time frame between those, there had been a lot of new studies that had shown that if a woman had an ectopic pregnancy and had to have surgical removal of it, it was actually better to take the tube that it had implanted on, and it would actually create higher chances for her to conceive natural to, to conceive naturally with one tube than to leave that tube there because the scarring that the tube created created a potentially very hostile environment wow. in the uterus for wow. another embryo to want to implant. Wow. So it's entirely possible that the miscarriages I were ha was having, and I had genetic testing done on those, uh, one of those uh, that came back was perfectly healthy seemingly. So nobody could know why I, so I to removal really facilitated and helped yeah i'm not advising that for anybody i'm i'm i do not want anybody to take this the wrong way i am not a medical professional and i would never tell somebody to take this advice and run with it please don't talk to your medical professional they know what's best for you but that happened to be what happened to me and a possibility is because my uh, first ectopic pregnancy was so advanced that it was excessive scarring that it left very excessive scarring. So when, when a woman has beta levels that are 9,000 or below, they'll give her medication, which is actually methotrexate, which now is illegal oh. in some of our places, some places, wow. um, to help that, to help the removal of that, um, of that ectopic pregnancy yeah. of that yeah. um, implantation. Cells, methotrexate. Yes. So it's a, it's a chemo drug. Yep. But if you are, if your beta levels are above that, uh, or the mass is too large, that's when they'll do surgical removal. Um, so what's very interesting is that um, it's, it's perhaps not the case for women who have had an ectopic pregnancy and utilized methotrexate to, to, for the removal. Um, but because I had such excessive scarring, it, it possibly Oof. played a role. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, that's all, all that's to say that I had such a very personal, you know, uh, investment in this. And so when our IVF failed at the beginning of 2016, I realized I needed, I needed to talk to other people about this. I felt very isolated. I felt very alone. I felt like nobody really understood what I was going through with the infertility. And I found a support group through Resolve. Um, and it was a lifeline for me. I've made lifelong friendships through that but it was a lifeline for me. And that year, 
the person who was facilitating it, she said, she asked if anybody wanted to join on advocacy day and advocacy day is a day where everybody, people from resolve, um, all volunteers go to Washington. This was prior to the pandemic. We would go to Washington and we actually had meetings set up with all of our federal legislators to talk about various legislation surrounding infertility. So a lot of the legislation when we first started, when I first started with them, um, and even now still centers a lot around veterans, because there was a lot of issues with any kind of support system veterans got for infertility struggles, which we all thought was absolutely ridiculous. So there were a lot of bills addressing that. Um, Once upon a time, the VA didn't even cover any kind of infertility assistance, which is ridiculous, because if you think about it, somebody literally put their life out on their lot on the line was injured during active military service and the reproductive organs were injured. And now you're telling them they don't get the right to build a family because even though they risk themselves and they, and they did that in the line of duty, you're not going to help support them now that they want to do something. They want to be able to build their family. That's not right. That's not okay. So, um, but there are the adoption care credit refundability act. There are so many pieces of legislation out there that really need to be moved forward to help advance a society in which people get to build the family they want to build without restriction. You know, there are so many people who want to adopt. Do you know how, after my second ectopic, I had a pretty terrible OBGYN. (laughs) And when I went for my follow-up, um, she was like, you know, maybe you should just adopt. And I was like, Oh my goodness. You know? Um, and it really upset me because she didn't get it. You know, you can't walk down to a corner store and pick up a kid. And if you do, you're probably in big trouble. (laughs) So, but the thing is that the loopholes that people have to go through to adopt, did you know that the average people of median income are the highest group of people wanting to adopt, but because of the, uh, the cost, it is not cost effective. And if there's a balance to that in tax refundability and credits and everything, they could actually adopt better. We talk about all these kids who need homes, but we're not willing to give them a break to get them into homes. I never even thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. of course. I, I, I adopted. Yeah. yeah. I've been down that road. Um, yeah. I mean, I've been down your road. I've been down this road. Uh, but there was never any help. Right. There was right. never any help and, and we could use yeah. some help. Guess what? There's still not enough help. We're probably There's still not. not enough help. And if we want to connect those kids to homes, we need to do a better job of actually making the work happen to do that. So there's the, so I went to that advocacy day that year, even though I did not have kids yet, even though I was still struggling with infertility and I felt empowered, I felt like I could actually make a difference when I'm feeling so helpless to help myself, I could turn around and help others. And when I realized that I was like, I got to do more, I got to do more. So, you know, uh, when the pandemic hit, actually, it was ironic. I had finally been in the stages of like, because my son came and I had to like make space for actually, you know, raising him and working full time and doing all these other things I had to, I still did my federal advocacy work, but I, I wasn't able to really jump wholeheartedly into the rest of it. Um, so I had to take a step back, but when right before the pandemic hit, I was actually due to start running, um, a peer support group, a local one. And when the pandemic hit, it was like, Oh no, what are we going to do? So we went virtual and the wonders of the virtual world of support group is that anybody from anywhere can come. So I've met people from all over the country, from Hawaii, from all over the place. I actually had an email from somebody who lives in Spain. She was American living in Spain, um, you know, and I've heard from so many people and that's the, the nature of the, the beauty of it is that you have the ability to connect with people worldwide and create a safe space for them to be able to share these extremely vulnerable stories and the hardships of having to deal with this thing that feels so wrong on so many different levels, because a lot of people who struggle with infertility feel like a failure in a lot of ways, because it feels like my body is failing me. My body is not doing its basic biologic function. And look, all my friends around me, you know, yet the truth is one out of eight couples in this country are affected by infertility. One out of eight, that is insanity. 
That is wow. crazy. By the way, is, is you, some of that environmental? Um, you know, there's there's definitely some newer studies coming out about it. I don't I don't know enough about the statistics behind the reason why, or if it's if it's sort of the chicken or the egg or the egg or the chicken. I'm not really a hundred percent sure. Um, I can certainly you know talk more about like you know what it what it does for people. I have a lot of statistics on like, you know, like the medical world and things of that nature. Um, I will tell you, I have a, like a document here that I want to pull up for real quick. So, um, there are what, as I said, one in eight couple, um, the CDC actually categorized, um, infertility as a disease, which is very interesting for a lot of people. Um, but, you know, it's interesting that a lot of insurers, there is a lack of insurance coverage for medical treatments and a lack of benefits in the adoption assistance. Um, you know, so what's very, what's really kind of sad is the U S government, the, the federal government is the largest employer in the U S and it doesn't provide access to care for family building wow. for federal employees. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And only 13 states have mandated insurance coverage for infertility treatments that include IVF and coverage varies widely. You have to go through so many different loopholes, right? There's like, and like, for instance, if they say they cover, if your insurance says that it covers infertility treatments, sometimes they'll make you go through six cycles of IUI um, in, before you can get to IVF. So uh, it, that's intrauterine um, inception. So it's it's actually where they they just utilize certain medical assistance to basically like baste your egg in a really like the most beneficial manner. I guess is what I could say. Um, you know, whereas IVF is different because they retrieve the eggs, they retrieve the sperm, they cre they they try to um, uh, fertilize that in a, in an um, a, dish and then they transfer it back in. Here's another kicker. A lot of people don't know this about IVF. They do not implant the embryo back in the woman. They do a transfer. That means they send the embryo up there and hope for the best. So you could have an embryo that looks beautiful. It's got great numbers. It, it's chromosomally healthy. It looks absolutely fantastic. The woman's uterus, the lining looks great her, all her hormones are in place and ready for it. You could do the transfer and it might not take. So what I think is really insane is that you say to people like, like, I'll just go through, you know, reproductive assistance and that's how I'll get my baby. The truth is that's not actually factual. It doesn't work that way. There are some countries who cover IVF up to two live births they cover all reproductive assistance up to two live children. That's crazy. Yet here, people go into debt. They go into debt. And you shouldn't have to do that. You're an American family. You should not have to cho choose between going into debt or building your family. So, you know, I can, you can tell I'm very passionate about it. Yeah, well, so am I because I've been there, done that. Yeah. We went in debt. Um we went in debt. It took a lot, a lot of years to get out of that. Um, no help, no nothing. Um, it's funny. We were uh, when we got into an IVF. Uh, we were we were quote elderly. I didn't, they didn't use that term, but it, it was implied, and and that was probably the reason why we got into the program because we were elderly the oldest uh in the in the program and they they wanted us for i guess uh statistics um we yeah were, we were stati uh, uh you know the, the, this whole thing uh why i marvel at, at this interview and, and having met you is because i've been there and i feel it and and that's a, a, a um you can't and you know you can't you can't describe the, the emotion. I finished writing a novel and there's a couple of chapters devoted in this novel to that experience, uh, the whole package. Um, it's funny. Yeah, I, I, 
uh, as as we were dealing with IVF on one hand, and, and it wasn't uh, uh, the counselor, your counselor, and, and the counselor said to my wife, "Do you want to be a mother? Or do you want to be pregnant?" Mm. Really yeah. powerful. Well, you know, it's very interesting that you say that because um, that is definitely something people struggle with. And I'll tell you, one day I was talking to a friend of mine while I was dealing with all of this. And she said, you know, you're willing to adopt. Uh, you know, you should really push Carl to, to be willing to adopt. And why can't, why won't he do that with you? And I was like, and she's like, but you want it. Why can't you get what you want? And I said, because we're in a partnership. And I didn't marry him to have kids. I married him because I love him and he's my partner and he's my family. And I've got to do what's right for my family. Because a lot of people forget that when you're, you make your family what it is. A lot of people make their family out of friends and people don't have their parents around. They don't have siblings, but they make, or for one reason or another, your family is what you make of it. And when you make that bond, that bond is so strong. It's so necessary to continue living in a healthy, functional manner as an adult. You don't just tell somebody, I want this and you're going to give it to me. That's not a marriage. A marriage is at its heart compromise. Everything you do is compromised because you're two different people walking, a, walking the same path. How do you make that path work for both of you? Well, a lot of it comes to compromise, you know? So when I realized he really wasn't comfortable with adoption, I started thinking about that. And one day he said something to me that was so sweet. I said, I said, I just want to understand like, why, like, why don't, you know, why wouldn't you do this? And he said, you know, if we don't have a kid with your quirks, I don't want uh -huh. one. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, I think you're insane because like my quirks are insane. <laughs> but I love you for loving me that much that you even love my quirks. That's great. And when he said that I was finally able to put myself in his shoes and realize he's right. I don't want a kid just to have a kid. I want his child. And that's when I realized that I was fully fine with not adopting. Yes, I knew we could be good adopting, you know, we could be good parents of an adopted child. We could, we had the potential to do that, but I realized it wasn't the road for us. And I was okay with that, you know, and a lot of people are not okay with that. Or a lot of people basically tell people who are, who are having, struggling with infertility, well, you know, you should adopt because that's your course. Like basically saying like, that should be your default. Like you get to adopt because, you know, and that's not how you want to go into adoption either. Because it's its own, I'm, and I know you know this, it's its own wealth of struggles and difficulties trying to raise a child that is not biologically yours and figuring it, is this about the adoption? Is this, you know, what, what, what is, where does this thing problem that we're having play into it? Is it a genetic issue? Is it a, what is it, you know? And I have a dear friend who's, who's adopted and she has an amazing TED talk. Her name is Ruth Monig, M-O-N-N-I-G. She has an amazing talk. Uh, te TEDx talk about being an adoptee. And it is amazing because she runs a lot of groups, support groups for people who are adoptees, because there are some people who struggle so much being an adoptee that they, she's even heard people who've said, maybe I just shouldn't have been born. They struggle with that in their identity. And it's, it tells you something. It tells you something about the world we live in. You know, why force people to have children that they are not financially, mentally, physically, medically, spiritually, emotionally ready for, and then force that now potential living person into a life that they is completely unknown. We can't control the path each individual person takes, even when we have the best of circumstances. How do you think we're going to control a path for somebody who has no circumstances, who has nothing set up for them, nothing in the way of success? So I feel like in a, in a utopian society where every child born has a beautiful, wonderful, perfect home, fantastic. We don't have that yet.
We don't have that yet. And it is one of the reasons why a lot of infertility associations like Resolve, a lot of other support systems, they are very scared about the nature of the current system that we have and the th things that are happening now. Because it also directly affects the way we create embryos, the way we do things in the scientific world of, of the, the methodologies that we use to help people bring in a birthing process of, of, of a child, you know? Um, so, you know, there's those personhood bills that are possibly out there. Those are very scary, very scary because they can absolutely directly affect people who want to have children of their own. So there's so much here. There's so much here. Oh, we could talk about it for hours you know but ultimately and i want to put this out there for people if you are struggling if you are on the start of the road of infertility if you are have been a veteran of infertility struggles for many years if you are a single person who really wants a child but doesn't want to just have a relationship so you can have a child there are so many resources if you are a person about the lgbtq community who understands the struggles that you are going to have to take a different path in order to build your family there are so many resources on resolve.org please go there there are faqs there are resources there are support systems there are understanding of the way people advocate the laws the legislation just basic knowledge of how adoption works and some details on that. And it's, it's an amazing resource for anybody struggling with this or worrying that they may be struggling, or perhaps they know that they're going to be hitting a struggle. Like a woman has PCOS or endometriosis, and she knows she's going to have a, a, an uphill battle to, to uh, build her family. So. Yeah. Well, uh, it, again, I, I say this again and again, uh, the, the, our, our chemistry or our, 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 our bonds and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know how often an interviewer and an interviewee uh, have so much, uh, especially in, 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 it's not rare, but it's rarefied. Uh, that's, I like the way I worded that. It's rarefied. I like that too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that word. Um, you know, my, you know, I've been, been there, done that on both yeah. sides of the fence, and I, I could, I could go on and and, and on, uh, just to lighten things because we need to sure. lighten things, and yeah. we'll never, we'll never get to everything I wanted to talk about because, uh, um, uh, which means, you know, come back, but uh, uh, sure. just a cute question to ask. Um, uh, I, I like this question. You actually don't even have to answer it, but sure. uh, uh, here goes. Uh, excluding, uh, I like this question, excluding family or friends, mm -hmm. somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with, and and, and actually you, it could be more than one. There's no rules to the question. Somebody I'd like to spend a day with? Yeah. Um, this is going to be funny. Stephen Colbert. Wow. He, he is so amazing. Um, he has heart and compassion every time, even when he's making jokes and, you know, and he makes, me, he makes me laugh all the time. So like, like the fact that you can tell that he's a person who doesn't take himself too seriously is a testament to, um, the strength of will he has. And like the, the, the strength of his, I shouldn't say will, but the, the core, um, strength of his humanity, you know, and I know he's been through losses himself and struggled, and we have that in, in common, that connection. Um, so if I ever got the chance to talk to him, and of course, he's talked to so many people, and he always makes people you can see feel very comfortable and very connected. So, yeah. Great answer. Um, there's so much more, but uh, I, I think we have to leave some of this for another time yeah sure. uh really you know uh, you know there's so much <laughs> no well, there is uh but i i think uh let's leave it for another time uh, absolutely perfect uh which means you know please come back okay i will uh, please come Happy back to. and we'll talk about it when we we're going to go off the air in a second uh, sure. uh about yeah. uh i 
am, my head is swimming and, and stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, uh, <laughs> Thank you for having me. I really appreciated your time. No, uh, really, and and and. and Words of uh, there's an old a Dirty Harry movie, uh, Clint Eastwood, when he said to he said to a bad guy, you know, um, go ahead and make my day. Well, you made my day. Oh, thank you did. You. Uh, so thank you, Yorona, uh, oh, yeah. uh To be continued, uh, and and this was great. And and, and actually, I'm, I'm, it's kind of interesting where to, you know we just because of the the bonds we just kept yeah. talking and we could have kept talking uh, i know hours <laughs> yep yeah thank you so much yeah. and, and we're going to go off the air now stay All right. um and to be continued everybody <laughs>